Uh, we had a little bit of an issue <laughs> this morning because um, Stephen Garner, um, who was meant to chair this um, panel, uh, is unfortunately has unfortunately got COVID going to Australia. So it's first time was traveling for three years and he came back with COVID. And so he's unable to be with us. So I've taken over the, the role of chairing this session together. So what really what we wanted to do was to start the conference thinking a little bit about directly about the theme that we've set for this year. So how theology and faith practices shape digital culture. Um, and this is really a reversal of the question and topic that we explored together at the conference last year, which concerned how theology was being shaped by um, digital culture. Um, and if you haven't seen uh, the, the papers, um, the, uh, there are both recordings and uh, papers on Curse's website. So, Maybe Frederica, you could add this in the, uh, the LinkedIn in the chat for those who want to have a look at that. So the conference theme is how theology and faith practice shape digital culture. And on surface level, I think sometimes I was thinking, is this just aspirational? <laughs> um, you know, given that the impact of, um, of the tech giants um, and the platforms and the devices is having globally, you know, as a globalizing force. Um, but the question that we do want to explore is really where do we see the impact of faith within this emerging digital world? And so with me, I've got Ray, Criselda, Elena, and Pete and Kate um, for this discussion. And um, eventually we will open up for questions. We'll see if time allows, but maybe we'll do a little bit of a breakout group for you to have smaller conversations as well. We'll see how things go. So I'm really excited to have you here. Um, uh, you are uh, situated in different parts of the world and have different focuses in, the uh, in your work. And so I just want to start maybe by letting yourself introduce yourself and uh, just maybe tell us a little bit about um, your interest in digital theology and the context that you're working in. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do this in order. Um, are we seeing the same order? If I pin, if I, no, we don't see in the same order. I don't think. Even if I spotlight. Okay. Well, so I'm gonna start with Ray. Uh, why don't you unmute yourself and, and tell us a bit about yourself? Okay. Thank you, Jonas. So mabuhay, uh, everyone. Speaking to you from south of Manila in the Philippines. And uh, again, you can call me Ray, uh, and I coordinate the Theological Network of Children in East and Southeast Asia. And also, alongside with that, I coordinate the Theological Commission of the World Evangelical Alliance. My background is in media and communications uh, and, and theology, which led me into space where for many years, I was able to help churches to reflect on their engagement with communication technologies, especially on how it can make for a well-rounded discipleship, ministry, and, and mission. I have a long interest in the impact of global digitalization, if you can call it like that, in the developing in developing context of the colonial policy in the majority world. So interestingly, I'm now finding myself at the heart of making connections, conversations, collaborations happen among different logical voices, different cultures, languages. And I can see how much of today's digital connectivity is also at the heart of that. Way. So that's me. Thank you. Okay, Kate. Great. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm glad to be with all of you. Um, so I'm in the United States uh, on the East Coast and um, I'm about to make a move. I was a professor of Christian social ethics at Drew Theological School, um, and I'm moving to Garrett Evangelical Theological School, which is in Chicago, Illinois, in the Midwest in the United States. Um, my work centers around ethics, particularly related to digital technologies, and my entry point for that was really the work that I do on children and youth and primarily the intersection with sexuality and relationships. So um, as I was doing lots and lots of conversations with, fake, with folks in their faith communities, parents, uh, Christian ed ministers, 
they started to ask questions about how to talk about digital technology. And prior to that, I had not really been interested in it other than for my own purposes of, of building websites and um, trying to hack small things. Um, and um, it was at that point that I really realized how deeply it was shaping who we are and how our communities form that um, sort of grew my theological interest in it. And so, um, Ever since then, I've been trying to, to write and be part of conversations that will have an impact um, on the congregational level for faith communities, especially for children and youth. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, brilliant. Um, Alina? Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm Aline. Um, I'm from Brazil, Porto Alegre. Um, I'm a journalist and uh, trying to be theology a little bit. <laughs> um, I start so studying communication and uh, after a meeting with Antonio Spadaro in 2012, I start to study theology. I did a, a master and doctorate in theology and especially about uh, digital theology, cyber theology. Um, uh, when I was uh, doing my doctorate, <clears throat> I attended a Theocom meeting in Santa, at Santa Clara University in California, uh, where I heard uh, Stefan Garner speak for the first time uh, on digital theology in 2019. And uh, currently, I am professor at uh, Pontifical Catholic University of uh, Minas Gerais, researcher at uh, a Center for Studies in Communication and Theology at this university. And we are researching now about uh, Catholic digital influencers. And uh, in Brazil, there are um, more than uh, 500,000 uh, digital influencers with more than 10,000 followers. So it's a, a really huge phenomenon in Brazil and have many research, um, have some research uh, about that. And a pecul peculiarity of this um, Brazilian influencer culture is the success of Christian influencers, Catholic influencers, um, especially priests, uh, influencers are among um, the most influential in Brazil. So it's very uh, interesting topic and uh, become an ecclesial challenge too. <laughs> and so uh, the bishops of Brazil request this research to think what is going on. <laughs> So it's very excited to um, think about these topics. And uh, yeah, I, I really like study digital theology. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Pete, be great to hear a bit from you. Hi, um, Pete Phillips. I'm the director of the Center for Digital Theology at Spurgeon's College, um, where we join us on the MADT course. Uh, but also developing quite a few other courses around digital theology to kind of uh, create the kind of pedagogic background for what we're doing. Um, so I'm a Bible person uh, in a former life. I started off in the New Testament, so I also run a biblical literacy course uh, in the temporary age, and I've written on that subject. Um, I'm then kind of um, supervising quite a few people um, in digital theology areas. Um, and we're just developing, we've got a deem in now at a United Seminary in the, in the States, uh, starting this summer, looking at MA, uh, sorry, the deem in in digital theology for mission and ministry, looking at how we might pick up digital theology issues in, in a pastor situation or a minister situation and develop that through a deem in program. Uh, we're looking forward, I hope this autumn, to developing a PhD track with a uh, European University um, at Spurgeon's, uh, beginning to take on digital theology students at uh, in London, Spurgeon's as well. Um, but also developing other courses, so Equip for Digital is an online course we're presenting 
um, 16 lessons, which some of you have done, thank you, um, on digitality and digital culture and ministry. Um, and yeah, trying to develop lots of other things. Uh, also writing and writing and writing, that's writing some of this time. I've just finished one handbook article. I've got the, the one for digital religion to write. And I've also played around with science and religion uh, on a metaphysics of information, um, which I'm writing up for Zygon, um, hopefully throughout this summer, uh, looking at digitality and quantum physics, which is fun. Oh. So that's me. Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, so I thought we'd start just a little bit with a kind of the, maybe briefly talk a little bit about uh, this, the, the kind of, the main question, as I see it, that's been discussed, and that is how digital technology and digital media have impacted faith communities and faith in general. Um, and maybe just we could start with the question, what, how do you understand technology in this context? And how would you define that in this particular context? So I'm going to just whoever wants to mute themselves can go. Okay, <laughs> so I can start. All right, that can be. But uh, when the uh, about this question, I remember some thoughts about uh, Antonio Spadaro. <laughs> I always uh, sit Antonio Spadaro because uh, it's the foundation of my thought too. So, uh, but I will formulate uh, with my own words. Um, technologies are increasingly taking on a value to, that touches uh, the highest dimensions of the human beings thinking, expressing oneself, communicating, understanding the world. So uh, one of our tasks, I think, uh, as Christians is to see with uh, new eyes technology and its products by asking ourselves about their meaning and value in God's project for the world. This, this question that uh, Spadaro talked one time really me, uh, do me thinking about it. So uh, digital technologies uh, have changed our language and communication. Uh, consequently, they have changed our way of thinking. Uh, the digital culture has also given rise to uh, new ways of being, uh, seeing and acting in the world. Now, therefore, uh, digital generations with their own characteristics, the new subjects for the church and society. Uh, if theology is understood as thinking the faith, intellectus fidei, uh, we could conclude that the digital culture has changed in some way, the way we think uh, the faith. So thinking, updating, rereading faith, and its practice uh, in digital times has become an urgent and relevant theological task. So for me, this is uh, a different way uh, that you use it to think about technology, but it's just a start. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so, so technology has cu and culture, linking technology and culture strongly there. Okay, who else want to have a go at this? Um, maybe I can I can share. What I like, what I'll be sharing, uh, is shaped by my, as I mentioned, interaction work with church communities and faith communities, and on that question, my earlier work has largely centered on reminding churches, church people, that digital technology, social media in particular because my generation was raised into that, into that medium. Uh, it's not just a tool that you can use, but a language. So you need to think short. You need to think in terms of visuals and much later on in terms of the audio. It's not moving, it's growing. And uh, that's a remarkable shift from being a faith that is 
reared on a text-based uh, culture to something that is more multi-rich media, right? And later on, my emphasis has turned into bringing out the reality that digital technology has also become a landscape, um, a landscape by which more and more people start to inhabit as an alternative, alternative space to build real relationships and nurture well-being, personal well-being, and that, that hopefully, uh, thankfully, the massive online migration of churches and ministries during the pandemic made that very clear. And there might be still be some people who are, are doubtful, but maybe just small. Uh, what I found helpful with regards to your question, Jonas, so how do you define the technology within that context? What I found helpful on communicating this to church people is the earlier articulation made by the media theorist Marshall McLuhan that media tends to amplify and also amputate the ways we communicate. So I found that uh, easy to be the grasp uh, by, by people to understand and be mindful of the fact that why, while they find digital tools serving their purpose and mission, uh, the technology also has the capacity to shape and mold them in its image in return. So I think that two way uh, is, is helpful. Go ahead, Pete. It's okay. okay. <laughs> so, um, so I think my, um, say the best to the last, Kate. Um, I think that my, version of uh, kind of thinking about technology with this whole kind of Bible stuff I'm doing at the moment. Um, and I think that I'm beginning to kind of think of technology as artifacts on the hypermediatization route, rather than objectifying different technologies or, or technological artifacts as being shape shifters or changes or change agents. Um, so a lot of people kind of go through the Bible and say, well, scroll, book, um screen um or scroll codex book screen um and kind of point to gutenberg's um press as kind of a big moment of change but culture and hep um my friend you know latest kind of sociology book kind of thing um they kind of want to say hold on a minute you couldn't have had the book without a whole load of processes happening beforehand so you know the fact that Bible demand was increasing beyond what monasteries could produce through handwritten books or hand copied books. Um, you know, the Tyndale Revolution, all, all this kind of stuff. Um, apprentices learning how to read a lot more and so on. And so commercial world develops and so on. Um, and, and then that leads to a technological shift. Um, so you get a new opportunity for the Bible to be produced in a different form. But, but in a way, that technology is just to kind of byproduct of the hypermediatization process, um, basically what um, Kuljan have argue, I think. Um, and, you know, that's close to um, Harvard's more kind of official kind of um, mediatization process as well. So, so I'm kind of, I'm a bit kind of wary of kind of us fetishizing technologies um, and saying, you know, the, well, this technology does this, this technology does that. And I think McLuhan does that a bit with, with what he does. He kind of, you know, um, it says this technology does something. Um, and if Heidi's right, and, and Stephen and what have you, then, then actually society shapes that technology and molds that, that technology. And, and kind of this idea that it's part of a hypermediatization process feeds into that kind of social shaping of technology because we shape the technology that we want. The reason that we had a move, move from a scroll to a codex was because the scroll was the scrolls are simply use, useless for, for preachers to carry them around with, for, to carry them from church to church and so on. They needed to find something which is a lot smaller and they needed something for the common people. So they needed to notebook format. Um, we need a lot more books, therefore we couldn't have the uh, chirographic copied text and therefore we moved to um, Gutenberg Press and so on. Um, and now we've got the phone and therefore we can put the Bible on it. And, you know, you read John Dyer's thesis and so on about that uh, coming out in Oxford Press any day, I think. Um, so, so you've got kind of that kind of sense that um, the technology is used by religion, shaped by religion um, and, and so on. 
but I want to come back later. I was just want to come back later to, to just query whether we've got a God in the gaps argument here, um, where we say that religion uses technology um, or religion uses these hypermediatization processes. We're part of them, as it were. Um, because I'm not sure it's quite as easy as that, but that's for that's for another question. Isn't it? Well, I think that's a good place actually for me to jump in, um, since my concentration thinking about ethics is about what humans are doing, um, and I'm I'm sure either God is part of that or we think God is part of that, but I'm not sure where <laughs> where that line is, and so I try to focus as much as possible. On, on us as human actors and the way in which we might take our beliefs and put them into action. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm always captivated by uh, John Dyer's telling of the stories of technology um, and the way in which, um, you know, we could think of technology as human activity interacting with tools um, in a way that bridges the world that we know now and who we are right now with the imagined world and our imagined sense of who we want to become. And so for me, that's the central kind of ethics is about who we ought to be and um, what the world ought to be and what we ought to do. And so um, I feel like that, that uh, that's my orienting way of thinking about technology. Um, I also in that, I like the use of world since it both incorporates the way we're using tools, as well as I'm not just thinking about our social world, but even, you know, even the way in which technologies shift our earth and clouds um, that, that contribute or do not to a sustainable world. Um, so maybe I'll kind of like branch us into the, the next question with my example. Um, so I've been thinking, and I think we all do, right, given given the way the academic conversation has been shaped around how digital technology in relationship to faith practices or religious practices come into play with issues of authority, um, access, network, whether that's um, the reach of faith communities or the connection that that digital technology creates among um, believers and others. And so I, I was thinking about the ways in which um, how technology itself or a particular kind of technology can offer a space or a tool for a, a group of believers to create this new imagined world. Um, and two of the examples that have, well, it's, it's one example, but two kind of iterations of it that have come to mind lately as I've been thinking about the intersection of sexuality, digital technology, and religious communities are the, um, groups that have arisen in maybe the last five years, maybe a little bit more, around both parents and ministries serving LGBTQ plus teens, who often, because of the region they live in, do not have any connection to people who might support them who might say, you know, you are, you are an amazing person created by God, God loves you. Um, and all they're hearing perhaps are either um, hate-filled messages or um, messages to ask them to change who they are in the world. And I think during the pandemic, that was probably especially amplified if you were in a family, in a religious community where your own identity was not accepted. So I've put in the chat, there's two Sorry, there's two groups in particular that I thought were interesting in the United States. The first is Beloved Arise, and that's specifically for trans kids. Um, and the other is Real Mama Bears. They are an evangelical group of, Eva, of LGBTQ parents um, or parents of LGBTQ kids. And both are working explicitly out of their, their Christian faith commitments to bring good news from their point of view. Um, and so I think this is a, from my point of view, a great example of how a, a human, you know, activity using the tools of digital technology, in this case, social media, um, it is trying to imagine a different religious world, a different 
place for these teens, both of safety, of love, and communicating a different kind of religious voice, um, which obviously we can all think about, right? Create, plays into these issues of, of network, of reach and connection, of access, um, and clearly of authority, given that um, the traditions these young people come from um, do not give them any authority or agency, and clearly don't give it to the people who are speaking on behalf of them or in support of them. Thanks, Kate. I think you let out the secret that we uh, circulated some questions beforehand. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, we're just looking, discussing some examples of how where we see um, the technology, digital technology shaping faith communities in the last few years. Shall I come in? I mean, I think I think you know, this is last year's subject, really, isn't it? That um, the way in which you know theology does shapes no that t technology shapes or digitality shapes religion. And I mean, you know, my book on Bible and social media and everything kind of raised the whole point that I think that um, digitality changes the way that we're sharing the Bible. So we're sharing the Bible in a very therapeutic way. So the whole Facebook culture that we have. Um, lead to a much bigger model um, or, or much kind of a, a bigger push of the therapeutic text and a downgrading with doctrinal text. Now that may well also be linked in to tons of other, other other social changes that are happening. And I think you know that that feeds into my whole kind of thesis. You know that I was going to speak if we yeah. Um, when when we go back to the other bit is that I think that it's a very it's a very difficult kind of thing to say that. Um, the religion is shaping digitality because you know that's almost like saying the beach is shaping the sea yeah uh, and it's just not the case the sea is much much bigger and a much more powerful model of doing things and um these theology and faith practices have kind of become small subroutines in contemporary culture um rather than being the kind of script that contemporary culture is written in the script isn't the script for um contemporary digitality isn't really theology it isn't um the big kind of you know field and and hence why so many theology schools are being closed down here in the uk and in europe and so on um and i think we can point to things you know case examples really really good um you can think about ways in which um key thinkers around ai and um, transhumanism are picking up on Christian themes as well. Um, but I'm not sure that it, I, I think we picked them up because we were very sensitized to them because, oh, Christians are there again. But this goes to the whole thing about whether this is God in the gaps. Uh, and we're kind of saying, oh, well, God's there. Look, God's there. You know, in Bostrom's paragraph on page 26, he talks about this. And that's really, really good because Christians get a mention. But that doesn't mean, you know, the other 300 pages of Bostrom's work are based upon Christian theories um, or, or, or faith practices and so on. Um, and, you know, the gods of the digital public square I wrote here tend to be Mammon and Amazon, not Yahweh. Um, and I just kind of I wonder whether more needs to be done about the public dissemination of um, theological, the, digital theology. Um, into the mainstream of technological society. You have places like Faith Tech that are doing it, you know, Adam and um, Chris Ridgeways, Adam Grave and Chris Ridgeways, Device and Virtue podcasts and so on, loads of podcasts all over the place that begin to get that into, into, the, into the ether, as it were. Um, but I'm yet to be persuaded, and I hope I'm persuaded by this conversation and what people put uh, in their questions and what have you, that there is a big difference. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I'll come back to the another bit in a bit. Okay, so um, maybe I don't know if any one of you wants to respond to Pete. I don't know if other people have specific things they had already planned to say, but just one quick response to that is. 
I wonder how our own understandings differ of the use of religion versus faith practices versus, you know, a values-based approach that is, um, that lines up with our Christian values, but is not unique only to them. Um, and that may be a place where there's a lot more activity going on. Like, yeah, I mean, I think, I think of even the, some of the origins around openness and, and in terms of like the creation of code and digital technology, which I know there's lots of problems with now, but even the groups that are trying to push back against that and say, no, we need to return to that kind of approach. Um, those for me seem to align much more with what I would characterize as Christian values. So though, though they're not synonymous with it and only under that umbrella. Um, anyway. I just want to throw that out there as we're having this conversation, but I know Elena and Ray have other um, answers. Yeah, in this way, I'm thinking that uh, an important change uh, is the expansion of the awareness. <laughs> Sometimes I, I have difficult with words. <laughs> awareness, I think it's that, of the space of the church, of the temple, uh, of the experience of personal and communal, communal faith. So during the quarantine, this expansion uh, became even more intense and clear. Um, the perception that uh, the church is not restricted uh, to the parish territory, uh, its physical buildings, but um, it is uh, present everywhere that human being inhabit and share their experience of faith has become clear. Um, I believe that churches have grown digital, digit, digitally uh, and have learned that community and communion are more important than physical buildings. I think it's the same way um, some parts of Kate uh, uh, talk about. And from this, I also think that uh, the digital revolution should be understood as an expansion of the understanding of reality, as well as the space of human ex existence. Uh, we can say that we have already overcome the initial dichotomy between real and virtual. Uh, the experience of physical confinement and expansion of digital so sociability aid aided uh, this understanding. Although uh, the change was ongoing and have had already been signed uh, Luciano Floridi in On Life Manifest writes that uh, the ever uh, increasing pervasiveness of ICTs shakes established, uh, established uh, reference frameworks through the following transformations. First, the blurring of the distinction between reality and virtuality, and second, the blurring of the distinctions between human, machine, and nature. So this is why concepts uh, such uh, as digital ecology and communicative um, ecosystems have become important today. So I think it's uh, this expansion that is an important change. For my part, maybe I would like just to pick up on what Aline ref reference, especially with the experience of uh, the feed community. In the last two to three years of the pandemic, and, and what I would like to highlight there is how different churches have experienced their faith, their spirituality differently because uh, maybe because they have no choice, there are no other ways to meet, this is the, the, the only way by which they could continue their work and ministry. And as a result of that, they were, they were forced uh, to, to get a, a new vision, a new vista of, of what is possible, which might be in the earlier uh, time. Uh, it's, it's something that 
perhaps they know because uh, churches have been tinkering with technology, internet, everything in the past, but may, they may not be able to fully latch onto it for many various reasons, institutional, practical, something like that. But these new experiences that they, that, that, that they, that they have gained and, and how it will impact uh, especially as they as they move as they move forward, I I, I really like that. Uh, I think uh, in the midst of the pandemic, the Asia Evangelical Alliance, for example, immediately came up with uh, with 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 a research, uh, a data that looks into how churches are actually trying to wrestle and grapple with the uh, with the changes uh, brought about by the uh, migration to online, the many things that they are. Uh, that, that they are doing. And what the data showed is that uh, there are many churches who are able to re reimagine ministries in different ways, wherein uh, one very striking for me is that previous to the, the pandemic, that most of their ministries are just within inside the church. But when, um, when they go, went online, they started to think about other communities, online communities and more of their work started to be outward, outward looking, or even just to uh, the, the data that says that the spirituality and togetherness and the fellowship uh, that they have felt using all of these technologies that allow them to be, to be together is very, very much positive. And so as the lockdown and restrictions eases, these new experiences of, of the faith and how do you carry that out afterwards? Um, I like to, uh, to be optimistic when uh, uh, Nachi Lazarus in a recent Lausanne gathering said that uh, in what could be a digital decade from 2010 to, to uh, 2020 to, to 2030, the next five years might be the critical period wherein the practices that the churches have gained, online digital practices, it will be these critical years where it can be carried out and see transformation. It will be a permanent feature of, of, of what they're doing. I think Pete's work on hybrid blended uh, way of putting together different communities on site, online, and how will that take, take shape and form? That already is a clear manifestation to us that uh, the massive adoption of technology accelerated by the pandemic has, will not leave the church the same way. Again, as also Alvin has mentioned, just opens a lot of opportunities and doors and challenges as well that the church needs to, to deal with. That's not theology also, I would say. Hey, I don't know if anyone wants to come back or any of that. Go on, Pete. Can I, I mean, you know, I think the religious practice, I think everyone's raised the whole issue about what happened during the pandemic. And, you know, there's a global phenomenon there of the change. Um, but I think these are niche, the niche activities of religious practice. Uh, come back to that phrase in a minute. But um, it's quite clear that, that um, religious practice did shape what happened during the pandemic. Um, so the theology of prayer, place, ritual, all influenced the way that churches, mosques, synagogues were replicated in different religious traditions. So I'm reading a little paragraph par uh, during the pandemic. Since, in, 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 interestingly, since both Islam and Judaism are focused on uh, family life, prayer reverted to the home and the extended family uh, with celebration of Shabbat and Iftars during Ramadan, having no need of mosque involvement, which is really interesting that uh, Judaism and Islam were able, was able to mix, move quite quickly uh, into a kind of non-centrified model, into a family-centric model. Um, in Sikhism, the ritual of feeding the hungry became more, uh, more important rather than less and shifted much more to the public provision for those suffering under the pandemic. So, so they've got three religious religions where the pandemic actually helped them to refocus upon core aspects of their, ministry, of their, of their practice. In Christian practice, there is more turbulence because churches which understood the church building um, as a representation of the temple, uh, they fought to keep access to temple space. Um, so see the United States, the, the issues there, but also in Scotland, there is a kind of re reflection there and Northern Ireland as well, which tends to be closer often to uh, states based um, uh, Protestantism uh, than UK based sometimes. Um, 
and often focus upon the Lord's Supper again. Um, other churches which maintain that our ecclesiology is focused in people rather than the building, they tended to shift not to this kind of representation of what was in the, happening in the temple, uh, but instead into um, much more community focused stuff. Uh, not replicating what was done in the pen tem temple, but uh, shifting to more communitarian online models of engagement. And we've seen all this in, you know, Distance Church and all of Heidi's books and so on, and um, the recent one on, on, on ecclesiology. Um, but contemporary contradictory ecclesial practice um, is often based on different micro, in micro interpretation of verses of the Bible. And that whole kind of thing of what do we mean by gathering, you know? Um, is, are we gathered here? Um, is this a gathering of God's people where two or three are gathered, Jesus is there in the midst? Is that true? Where is Jesus? Is Jesus, because he's, you know, omnipresent, is he present um, in each of the rooms in which we're, we're sat? Uh, is he present in actually the, the technology or in the kind of electric that's being used um, to, to fit between, are we all quantum entangled with Jesus? Uh, because we're all involved in this quantum moment. Um, what, what's happening here about presence and, and gathering and so on? Um, and do we change that as being religious? Yeah, that, that's my thing. That have we changed something by us meeting together and being here and uh, seeking to gather in this particular way? Um, so, so, so we then get into the whole kind of thing of, well, what's happening post-pandemic? And it's a lot dirtier. It's a lot, you know, more awkward. Many churches face financial meltdown during the lockdowns. Now they need people back in the building to increase their offering to pay the debts accrued by having large properties left empty um, or to bolster the authority of the leader. Um, often those who choose to continue to watch online are criticised for their choice of religious expression. They're said to be lazy. Uh, concerned, uh, more concerned with watching God in their pajamas than making an effort to come to church. Uh, the, the, you know, you can hear these these statements being said. There's talk of them doing church at their own convenience rather than attending when the faithful come to church on a Sunday. Um, and it's quite similar to problems that there were there in the early church in Asia Minor when the state asked people to uh, offer incense to the emperor or to the imperial cult or to the emperor. Um, some refused and were punished for that, um, but some decided, as Paul argues in Corinthians, that cult is nothing, therefore incense, offering incense is not a big deal, and they did it. But the first and second century church then often refused to take those incense burners back into the church. You know, they had, they had polluted themselves. And we're having the same kind of thing here with people who kind of were on, staying online um, to do worship, that they're polluted now by their online digitality and they're not proper churchgoers because they're not attending in person um are they are online christian dabblers in digital as opposed to the digitally resistant online congregations who presumably are the more pure in practice so so kind of it's really interesting how we seek to change digitality but but often there is resistance to that change within the church um and also plurality in our change to digitality, in that some churches simply replicated and live streamed what was happening. Others went for more communitarian models. Others shifted in, uh, into a completely different model. Uh, and that's, that then creates different levels of theological engagement with that digitality as well. So, so it's not just that we have a theology and that theology can transform digitality. We have multiple theologies that is translating uh, multiple forms of digitality in multiple forms of way and finding resistance both from within the church and and from without the church outside of the church i'd like to come back to internationalism in a bit but that's i guess i just want to say yes to a couple of the questions pete asked <laughs> If, if we believe Jesus is where two or three are gathered, we're gathered. Jesus is here. And uh, I'm not sure Jesus's presence changes the network connection that I have any differently than Jesus's presence changes the street corner I stand on before I meet people at church. Um, 
in terms of those being physical things that that shape my world. Um, but again, I'm just going to go back to you from my point of view, how does it change how I'm interacting in those spaces? How might that change the way people design those kinds of, of spaces or, or technologies or use of those technologies? Um, so, so I guess I'm, I'm maybe aligning a little bit with an old school. It's a tool. And until we start interacting, it's, that that's where the cultural shaping is happening. And I think we're the ones bringing Jesus's presence to that. Um, and Jesus is already there though, unless recognized, there's no impetus for a value-based kind of change. Um, but I also wanna just say, yeah, I think the, the fun of this conversation, the imagination and the curiosity of it is that it is always theologies. It is always churches. Um, and, and I think even recognizing that multiplicity is something that in engagement with digitality pushes. Um, so that may again be a way in which thinking technologically first and faith second forces us, um, I think, Christians who tend to have this desire to have an all or nothing where it's my my version of Christianity and there is no other, it forces us to accept the multivocality of Christianity, um, which right, the gospels alone force us to do if there's multiple of them. Um, so anyway, just a, a few responses to some of the things you threw out, Pete, that I think are great, that, that move us into that space. Um, and also the one quick thing I wanted to get in, um, was the ways in which perhaps offline experiences in faith communities may in fact shift um, or have an impact on how religion and faith practices affect technology. Um, so rather than us always looking because of COVID, how folks went online and did things in digital spaces, might we now also spend some time thinking about what what are the offline ways that we are regathering or or committing or thinking um, that will continue to have an effect um, in terms of either technological design or use um, or engagement in those spaces? And I don't have a quick example off the top of my head, um, but I have been thinking about the question of what happens when we lose the space. This is a US probably very centric problem, but what happens when we lose the offline space of faith communities gathering in the flesh when it happens to be one of the only intergenerational experiences that people have in the United States. Um, and, and what that, you know, how that intergenerational experience then actually can start to shift how we think about technology from like, a critical digital literacy perspective. Um, it's not a concrete thought or example, but um, it makes me wonder what will happen um, and what its potential is if we were to leverage it um, now that now that COVID's done and we do have more people, some people returning to those spaces. Hey, um, Ray, Elena, do you want to come in at the stage? Well, maybe what I would just like to, to add, as I mentioned a while ago, is that a new experience and a new, a different way of experiencing the faith will lead you to a little bit different way, hopefully, of also imagining it uh, uh, anew. And when when the church uh, started to to explore different spaces by which they can they can gather. Spaces that, that they are now not comfortable with in the in the past, and now you have new participants coming in, whereas uh, that is not able to join in the past because it is the technology that allows them to be there, right? And 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 the question of whether uh, is this uh, which is what well, which is superior, the ones that in we are in the same room and we we breathe the same air. Or are we in a in a space wherein we breathe a different air, but we bring in more different people who could not otherwise uh, join us? 
but we we are able to to gather more uh, and more now very sort of people and it, it forces it forces a, a faith community even if it's skeptical many theological baggages of of why they would not consider a particular space for gathering as as, as legit or 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 within the ambit of their uh, theological articulation, but experiencing experiencing to, to, togetherness with those kind of people, hopefully it forces them to reconsider some of this theological uh, grounding that might need to be reconsidered on how we think about epistemology, how how we think about liturgy, how how we think about the presence of Christ, as as Pete has said. And, and if we if we look at that at the, the present surprise in the others, and so you are able to to see more of these people who would not uh, otherwise be in the church, but now they are there. So hopefully it courses uh, some of the arguments uh, against uh, reimagining the faith I know to move a bit. So I think my my my, my thought is just working along those lines. A short uh, thought. <laughs> um, I think uh, before pandemic, we thought about the church in the digital age, like uh, what is the impact in our faith and uh, uh, how it can contribute. Uh, during the pandemic, we thought about uh, the digital church. So this experience of the church in the digital, uh, more intense, um, and now we are in this way of integrate, of uh, thinking in a hybrid church, thinking in a on life church, uh, in the sense that uh, we need uh, this, uh, uh, what Kate uh, said about uh, the experience, uh, physical experience in the church is the only intergeneration uh, meeting uh, and share. I think uh, after pandemic, I think it's not uh, anymore because in the digital it uh, could be and sometimes is uh, uh, intergeneration uh, meeting, at least in this experience of the, the, the church in the digital. Um, but I think we are trying to 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 walk in this way, but uh, like Pete said, have many res resistant uh, resistance in this uh, thinking. Many churches uh, we have a great experience in digital, but now we we are just offline. So uh, we need, uh, I think, uh, try to help this this path. Uh, in integrate this uh, all experiences of reality and uh, share faith. Can I, can I come back? I think I was really interested there about um, Helena's response about um, the resistance and everything, because I think that, that we may be on the, the change, we may be on this point of change about um, so, so, so Kate at the beginning talked about a progressive model of change, um, whereby LGBTQ issues are dealt with um, well within some churches, um, and that enables a kind of spread into uh, mainstream culture and so on, which is also uh, generally in dem democratic societies more LGBTQ, um, pro-LGBTQ. Um, but what we're beginning to see now is a reshift of that as repressive regimes take over. Um, and so, you know, Putin's, um, you know, uh, Eastern Coalition, um, if it is an Eastern Coalition with China, um, and what's happening there. Um, but you've also got Orban and Johnson in 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 Europe as well. Johnson's hopefully out, on the way out. Um, but but what will come after him? Because he's shown a model now of breaking down democratic constitution in the UK, um, and it's usually the case that the first person in to do that then simply opens the gateway for others. Uh, to do more repression and so on and there is a repressive model um, that's available hence you know shipping our, our refugees off to to Rwanda um, 
but, but what will happen with Christian nationalism in states um, and that repressive agenda, you know, we've seen what the Supreme Court is coming out with. And so, so, so that's really interesting because that's a way really of the church um, reconstructing digitality. And so the church, you know, though, though we've talked a lot about online church and everything, um, the Catholic church doesn't permit online communion. Um, and, and, you know, the mass was, re was restreamed, live streamed, um, but it's very, very hard in most Catholic settings to actually, you know, have a celebration, including Zoom and so on, I think. Um, now, you know, what happens there? That's kind of a repressive form of engagement with digitality, although for good reasons, I think it's, that Catherine has uh, written remarkably about. Um, and, and, and Tiffany, seating. Um, sorry, somebody's put some chat. And, and then, but, but, but will that become more so with Putin? Will it become more so with what's happening in states and in other societies where um, re re religion sides with more um, punitive societies which want to restrict what we can do and um, say, no, this has to happen in this particular way and dehumanizes, you know, some of the stuff that Kirilla said uh, from Russia about Ukrainians and so on. Um, and that's really interesting as well, whether religion in that sense will seek to, kind of more repressive religion, will seek to limit digitality and limit the, the kind of openness and inclusion of digitality. Um, and that's it, you know, you can see that in kind of, you know, you can see that with Daesh, you can see with it what happened with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and so on, um, when repressive Islam came in and, and took over as, as it were. Um, and I think there is some kind of anxiety in my, my heart, at least, um, about where this might go. It's not just good news to say that, you know, re religion's effect upon digitality is always to kind of bring in the good ethics or bring in the positive. Um, I just fear that we're, we're at a turning point in, in human society, which may, may be a result of our, the pressures the climate is putting us under, uh, which we all need to be on. Okay, thanks, Pete. I think that kind of leads as well into the, the final question I want to explore before we, we give an opportunity for a bit of a wider conversation. Uh, and that is that kind of question of what, where, where do you see faith communities and maybe theologies um, having something to communicate and say and offer to this uh, digital world and this emerging digital culture? I think the first thing I want to say is that any smart repressive regime actually leverages digitality. They just do so in a way that only expresses their message. Um, so I don't think they're going to cut down on digitality. I think they're going to fully leverage it, um, but in a way that erases any other voices. Um, so just in, in terms of, yeah, in terms of expression versus use. Um, And now I've forgotten the main question. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> say it again. I just, my head was swimming with Supreme Court and everything else. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, yeah, I think it's more like, I, maybe I'll rephrase it slightly then in more of a more positive terms. Um, maybe I will just rephrase it simply, what do faith communities and theology have to offer a kind of a digital culture? Thanks. Um, and I did have an answer to it. I just left my head. Um, I mean, I think th that's the place I'm, I try to find my home, which is to say, you know, we're morally discerning people and can't we bring that moral discernment to both our individual, our communal, but then also on a larger scale, the way in which we educate our communities and invite them to think critically about their own, their own presence, use, and expression. And we never know whether we have, you know, designers in our community or, you know, what kind of legislation we might affect by the type of advocacy. I mean, from my point of view, I think Christian communities have always been a space 
whether it's for policies I agree with or policies I don't, to be a space of politically engaged individuals out of our faith commitments. And from my point of view, that's always going to change the way the world functions. And so at this point, my only hope is that we not let things like digital technology seem already determined and instead start engaging the questions around how they're designed, how we use them and how, how we'd like legislation to have an effect in the future on those processes. Uh, I think um, the first thing that uh, uh, we can try to answer or thought about is that uh, we are prosumers, uh, even in the book of uh, Stephen Garner and uh, Hyde Campbell have uh, something about it, that we are in this digital culture, we are pro productors, producers and uh, users. So uh, everything that we do uh, in, this, in, in some way change this this culture uh, so if we think about the presence just the presence of the many religions of the many faith many community uh, communities online we are shaping we are changing but sometimes it's not a good uh, a positive change uh, have many kinds of uh, experience and way ways of um, expressing faith some lead to intolerance misinformation hate speech unfortunately others bear fruits of tolerance solidarity fraternity openness to dialogue with society uh, and these things uh, so we have many kinds of shape um, many kinds of impact our uh, express our uh, thinking about faith in the digital culture. Uh, and it reminds me to the thinking of the Peter Berg that uh, changed uh, in this last years that uh, first uh, he thought about uh, secularization theory that uh, the modern thinking will, uh, will kill the religions and uh, we see that it's not true it is uh, the contrary or it's not at least true uh, because the the religions continuous uh, and uh, they are very present in this in this di digital culture in this modern thinking and uh, uh, shaping in some way uh, this this digital culture um, I was thinking too about the digital culture begins in the Western civilization, which even thought secularized uh, is born from the knowledge and the values of Christian culture. So in some way, in the beginning of the digital culture is already there uh, some shaping, Christian shaping. And uh, uh, Jerome Lanier talk about how this Christian imaginations uh, about uh, faith, about uh, the way um, of uh, Christian think about many, many things uh, was there in, in the beginning of the, the, the create this technology. So uh, I think uh, have many connections. I, I think we uh, cannot say how much we cannot measure this, at least I don't, <laughs> but uh, uh, our faith is since beginning uh, shaping this digital culture. But um, the, the, the question that Jonas uh, think, and uh, many years ago, I heard something uh, similar from Spadaro that I, I started to, to, to study theology for this question, how we can contribute to, to have a good life, have a well uh, 
being of uh, live in these days, in these times of network, in these times of uh, connection, um, in these times of hyper reality. So how can we contribute? I think I don't have this answer, but uh, we are in some way for a bad or for good, we are shaping this, this digital culture. Okay, let me pick on that, Aline. Uh, my response, Jonas, will come by way of two, two very short stories that illustrates how uh, a possible response to how uh, the faith communities can have a hand contribution to, to, to shaping digital culture. Okay, the first story is the story of my country. Okay, uh, the, the Philippines has been uh, regarded as, as the patient zero in terms of uh, weaponizing social media um, for in aiding a particular political interest or, or, or group. And a lot of that uh, revolves around uh, uh, leveraging the, the use of information or more exactly disinformation or what is popularly now we call as fake news. And, and in my country, that has uh, resulted to a very uh, divisive political situation, a very controversial uh, the head of state. And, and so uh, we have seen how, how we could be so socially divided and, uh, and it has a lot of that divisions, hatred, uh, arises from the spread of disinformation in various communities online, which chips to also offline. And you can see that what happens in the digital, it's very, very real. It, it happens in the real life. And, and so this conversation of, so what do we do exactly with social media? It promised to be uh, with, with, with the potential of bringing people together, making connect uh, communities uh, more, more, more possible, but our experience of it in the last two, in the last uh, six years is exactly the opposite of that, and the global conversations and narratives are around it uh, is not so much different. I mean, the MIT uh, uh, forum held last year, they were trying to to discuss. So, what do we do with disinformation? How do we combat uh, now now fake news? The panelists are practically clueless. I mean, do you go uh, uh, after each fake news? And, and fact check it, the, the, the thing is they can produce more fake news than your capacity to actually run after each of it. Or, you, or do you dis, dismantle where this is coming from? And in my country, we have identified that, uh, and, and, and this is right, it points to what we have been talk, talking about that it's not really just the technology that is uh, uh, animating this, but there are human agents. So we, we call this networks or architects of network disinformation. There are people, human, human beings who are actually uh, employing uh, a bad use of, of the technology which affects an entire nation. So, so the narrative is, is so bleak. So what do you now do with social media as, as a tool? And here's, and here's where my, my, my second story comes in. And this affects me personally because I'm a student of media as well. So I need to give answers to students. So, so what happens to social media, social goods? So do we throw it out of the window already? Uh, some people are saying Mark Zuckerberg needs to do something about it. Europe is blocking him because he's not willing to alter or, or, or move a bit about uh, his preferred nanotech policies. And then this is what happened. Um, during the, the pandemic, I, was, I, I did mention I was involved with with Tier Fund, we are actually um, engaging, nurturing, or, or building this network of churches that are doing holistic mission in their communities. Every every year, we are gathering them physically in uh, in a nation. And the difficulty in our region, in if you look at the map in Southeast Asia, we are separated by by geography. It's very hard to bring people together. You need you need you need to fly them. It is costly. Uh, it is very costly and it is very difficult in terms not only of geography, but also of, of language. So whenever we gather physically, we, we need to, hold, to have all of those translations fly, fly people together. But what happens during the pandemic is this, uh, because that is not possible. So this group of people from six to seven countries in Asia and Southeast Asia, amazingly found ways to be together. 
uh, using the, a platform that for so many of them, it is alien to them, but they have the, uh, the, the, the learning curve uh, kick in as they, as they use it. And for the past two to three years, they've been meeting regularly online. And, the, and, they, and they have built this very strong faith community across different countries. And because of the functionality of Zoom, even the language barrier was easily solved because you can easily have trans, 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 translators in. And so what that gave me is a narrative. It's a different narrative of how uh, if a community, in this, in this case, a faith community is cognizant and intentional of how they would like to use a particular technology for the benefit of its community. And in this case, because we are engaged in mission in the community, the benefit of other people, the common good, so so, so, so to speak. The force, uh, the narrative of, so what do we do with social media? Then you can get a different story. And uh, if more and more, I think if more and more faith communities are, are able to leverage on that and show how something like the audience would use the word, Redemption. I mean, how do you redeem uh, a dysfunctional, very deep divisive uh, uh, a development in the way we communicate? So maybe, maybe that could contribute to, to sending a different narrative in the wider conversation about, say, say, for example, a technology like social media. So I hope that helps. Sure, thanks. Uh, Pete, I'm going to let you have the last word briefly. I'm sorry. Um, I think that the biggest problem, of, the biggest weakness in my argument, uh, which has been a bit critical today, um, is that, that we've talked all about faith practice and church, which is kind of the sociological or ethnographic model of digital, digital ethnography or digital religion, as it were. But this is digital theology. And what we haven't talked about is, is the macro picture of where God is in all of this. Um, and you know, part of the metaphysics of information, and everything that you have to wait for the Zygon article to come out. But of it is actually to query where God is in the whole process of advance or pro progress or information and so on, um, where God is in quantum and so on. Uh, if, if, God, if God is indeed not just the initiator, but um, part and parcel of that, of the world's process of the way we subsist or exist, um, as the theologians have always told us, God holds all things together, then of course God must affect digitality and therefore the church must also affect digitality must change digitality um but it's really interesting about how that happens how do we get from god's agency um the logos jesus being the kind of information that fills the world the kind of dna of technology or the dna of anything happening or or coming into being or, or subsisting then then how do we operate with that subsistence of creation um because because as long as we're kind of in the nitty-gritty of oh this doesn't work and this doesn't work and these people don't like us current continuing with online church that then that, that we're messed up in the kind of the messiness of create you know created out created acts but but the bigger picture is where is god in digitality where is god in progress progressive religion or you know repressive religion um and and that's the bigger picture that we've kind of not really jumped into because we've been we've jumped back to the digital religion and stuff um jump back is the wrong word isn't it um but but you see what i'm trying to say i just want to say that that, that perhaps perhaps i need to lift my thoughts up really to, to to contemplate what god's up to um rather than to look at the creation um just just created artifacts uh, and say actually the the where is god in this where is the logos in this where is the spirit in this um because that's where the digital theology really gets exciting i think now okay thanks Pete. um i'm aware that we have been online for an hour and a half already um which is a bit long time um so i i'm kind of going between maybe we'll do breakout rooms just for 10 minutes because that gives you an opportunity to talk a little bit more intimately in a more intimate group about some of the issues that have been discussed in the panel so far so um i'm going to get give you about 10 minutes to do so i know it's not very long but at least it's a short opportunity to to um discuss some of the things that have been talked about